This is the word of the Lord. Please sit. That was interesting. You don't normally start a sermon that way. And yet we got the Pavlovian response. I'm reminded of the bishop who was putting on the microphone at the beginning of the service when they hung microphones around your neck. Uh, And something went wrong. Uh, And so he said, there seems to be something wrong with this blooming thing. And the congregation immediately came back, and also with you. You should have sat up and taken notice, actually. If somebody says, this is the word of the Lord, then you should at least have thought, well, it better be pretty darn good then. Uh, Because if you don't, if it's just a phrase that doesn't startle you slightly, then the danger is that you're like that seed which fell on the path. They were simply hardened to it. Your heart is not open to receive. You heard it all before. After all, you've been coming, some of you have probably been coming 50 or 60 years or more. You have heard it all before. So sit back, relax a bit, join in the hymns, but don't pay any attention to what's said at that lectern, and particularly not what's said up here. The first requirement for something to be to you the word of the Lord is that your heart is open to receive it, to expect that there is something there which will, if not rock you to the core of your being and change the whole of your life, and let's be honest, you can't change the whole order of your life every Sunday, will at least encourage you on your way, build you up, and sustain you. The word of the Lord is supposed to be something pretty awesome as Isaiah describes it in our first reading. It won't go out and achieve nothing. It's not just vanity, vanity, blowing in the wind. It is that which has effect. And so when I say the word of the Lord, what do I mean? Do I just mean the Bible, simply? Well, yes, absolutely and utterly and completely. Uh, And if we have a heresy in this church, actually we have several, and one of them will probably be said this morning, but it is that we make this great splash about the gospel, as though that was the word of the Lord, and the rest of what we said, the other two readings, don't really matter. Uh, And we make that worse by not saying at the end, this is the word of the Lord, but have this rather arbitrary selection of sentences that Nicholas cobbled together. Uh, But the Bible is the word of the Lord because it testifies and is the only real testimony we have to the true word of God, which is, as John's Gospel points out, Jesus Christ himself, the living word. And only through the words written in Scripture can we begin to have contact with him. Through the words in the Gospel, yes, but the testimony to him in the New Testament epistles and the Acts of the Apostles and throughout the Old Testament, which is building up to him. Now, that doesn't mean that every sentence will rock you in your path. We have at morning prayer been going through the book of Job. Uh, and at the end of it, some of that, very frequently, the person reading has said, this is the word of the Lord. And we've all gone, really? But you see, poor old Arnold uh, was waiting for the one key sentence for him in the book of Job. I know that my Redeemer lives. And he missed it. <laughs> whether he wasn't there that morning or whether he didn't notice it, I don't know. Uh, the part of the book of, thing about the book of Job is a lot of it is written so that people could say things that were wrong to have them shown wrong. But the Bible is the principal way in which we approach God because it is the principal approach to Jesus Christ. And that word should arouse an expectation in us that this is not like another book. This is really going to tell us something that we need to sit up and take notice. 
So there's something about the way that you listen with an open heart that will take it in. Not everybody did that, even for Jesus. Remember, the Pharisees were not overly impressed at the end of the day. Remember the rich young ruler came to him and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, Jesus, give me the word of the Lord for me, my own personal private message. And what did he get? Sell all you have, give to the poor, and follow me. Precisely the set of words he couldn't, couldn't bear to hear. And he went away. His heart was hardened by the cares of this world, by the love of wealth. And so he didn't. I'd love to know what happened to him, but he didn't follow Jesus at that point anyway. It is easy to be drawn away. The word may strike into your heart. You may come out of church this morning and say, yep, that's going to be me from now on. And then by the end of the week, it's forgotten. And very easy to forget because we live in a world that is the title of a book written about 20 years ago, amusing ourselves to death. There's so much to distract you to take your attention away, simply to fill your time and take up your mind. Or maybe it's some other obsession. It can be anything. I mean, I've never regarded steam railways as particularly sinful. If they are, then most of the, uh, many of the clergy of the Church of England are damned. There's a strange correlation between being a Church of England clergyman and having a fascination with steam engines. After all, who was it wrote Thomas the Tank Engine? Reverend Audrey. Yes, absolutely. Uh, But for Mike, I'll call him Mike uh, because his name was Michael. Uh, But he was too far away and long ago for this to be any breach of confidence, I don't think. Um, He was joined our church, came into our village, and he came in and... I don't know whether I converted him or what it was, but he came in with with enormous enthusiasm and could not get enough and was a vital presence and brought his whole family in. And it was lovely. And then suddenly he wasn't there. And when I went to track down what had happened, he had gone one Sunday instead to treat his son to the local heritage railway, become hooked, And his whole life was now dedicated to becoming an engine driver. Something you should have grown out of, actually, by about the age of 12. Uh, It can be anything which takes your attention and becomes your guiding passion instead of the guiding passion to follow Jesus Christ and be led by his word. Finally, there is that good soil, which is open, which is transformed, which brings forth fruit, which hears. You see, the converted life is a converting life. It influences. It doesn't simply passively partake of the word of God. It is led by it to do things, to be different, to create as the word of God is created well it's what our heart is like it's how we are prepared so I once set out to write a book with the title why is church boring which is let's face it the common estimate of it and maybe your estimate of it too but I gave myself to this project Uh, And I read books on the psychology of learning, on communications theory, on liturgy. And then suddenly I I stopped and realized I didn't know. And as I thought about it, I came up with the answer. And it was so simple that the book went out the window. Because how can you write a book that is one verse long? And it simply is this. What is not boring is what is important to you. If you think something is important, 
then even if it is handled in a bad way, it still gets your attention and grips you. And you may groan inwardly and say, oh gosh, it's so important, why isn't it being done better? But you won't think it's boring. You think it's important. And so thousands of people can stand and watch 22 grown men squabbling over possession of a ball. What's so important about that little sphere? And why don't they just get that guy in black on the field to agree? You know, to make a judgment and say, you won, go home. Save all the mess. And it gets even worse. You get 50, 30 of them together and you actually get physical violence over who should possess this piece of leather. It's so important. Everybody's agreed it's important. Everybody's cheering and shouting and groaning. Perhaps you're groaning at the moment, at least inwardly. I don't know. It seems important. And that's the essence of a church that hears the word of God. It believes it's important. And if you believe it's important, then maybe you'd want to say to people, hey, come along. It's important. It will make a difference. It will transform you. Because in this church, in this liturgy, in its hymns, in its reading, and on a good day in the sermon, you'll hear the word of God. And you will not go away unchanged. So, there we are. And if this sermon wasn't to you the word of God, I apologize. I guess... I'll humbly admit, I'm not quite such a good preacher as Jesus. But maybe you haven't heard, and that's your problem. And that is the word of the Lord.